Follow us to stay updated on debates, discussions, facts and tips about health. Click on the subscribe button and the bell icon for latest updates. My name is Sheila Krishna Swami and I'm very happy to introduce to you Dr. Aruna Kalra and Mrs. Shaini Surendran, two stalwarts in the field of PCOS. Let me begin by introducing Dr. Aruna Kalra. She's a well-known gynecologist and obstetric surgeon presently associated with CK Birla Hospital in Gurugram. Dr. Aruna Kalra brings over 25 years of experience in her field of practice. Her expertise lies in minimally invasive gynecological surgeries, high-risk pregnancies and vaginal birth after cesarean, and scarless laparoscopic surgery. Welcome to the program, Dr. Kalra. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Shaini Surendran is an accredited sports dietitian and preventive health nutritionist with a master's in dietetics and food service management from Chennai. She is the first Indian to be certified with graduate diploma in sports nutrition from the International Olympic Committee. She has also done sports nutrition courses from Australia and New Zealand. She has consulted for sports and other celebrities. She works extensively in the area of weight management, PCOS, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, hypertension, et cetera. And she has been working in this field for 22 years. Welcome to you, Shaini. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here, Michelle. Thank you. Great. So let me begin by asking the most obvious question to uh, Aruna. Aruna, why is PCOS now more common than it was in the past? Uh, yeah, it is actually it has become a uh, an endemic, I would say. Uh, and mostly, um, uh, even uh, Shiny would agree with me that lifestyle has changed a lot. And PCOS is a lifestyle disorder. It is not a disease or ailment of one organ system. It is a syndrome. So uh, 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 girls nowadays, or in fact boys also, and that is why we have obesity, hypertension, cardiac disease early uh, in life in their 20s itself. Uh, so these girls, um, when they uh, start uh, their puber puberty, like at around 11, 12 years of age, uh, they have this uh, baby fat, okay? And uh, we, uh, we uh, for initial four or five years, uh, when uh, periods are starting, uh, ovary and pituitary axis is, is developing. And initial irregularity in periods, we do not consider it as PCOS, but because of obesity, because of uh, unhealthy lifestyle, because no sports and all the time sitting in front of computers and now because of COVID, all the more it is, it is bad. These girls stay obese uh, during those pivotal uh, years and uh, suddenly they are in PCOS bracket. Uh, they never had regular proper periods. So initial periods we say that, okay, because ovarian and pituitary excess has not developed and that is why cycles are related, which we all faced uh, after 45 days, after two months. But then they never uh, actually had normal period cycle ever because they were obese and they, uh, they went into that PCOS. So first and foremost thing why it is increasing is because of bad lifestyle. It's because they are not exercising, it's because they are all the time in front of computer and screen time also has uh, lots of effect on um, uh, hormonal imbalance and ovarian function. Interesting that you know you talk about lifestyle being linked to PCOS and the increase in incidence, which brings me uh, you know, uh, to uh, the first question to Shiny, because lifestyle uh, also involves diet. So uh, what foods do you think have an influence in, um, uh, in increasing PCOS or even perhaps, uh, you know, worsening the condition. Yes, and um, as Dr. Aruna had mentioned, lifestyle really plays a big role and nutrition forms a, a major, major contribution to the PCOS uh, entire spectrum of uh, symptoms. And uh, most often that we get to see is the intake of sugars because it's so addictive and children that age, you know, right from, you see that in teenagers. So, uh, and there's also a lot of stress when board exams start. So I've seen a pattern with 
uh, 10 standard and 12 standard kids, that is the time that they go through quite a lot of stress and a lot of them end up with PCOS related issues. So sugars is one, any form of sugars. So it could be white sugars or it can even be large amounts of uh, jaggery or any kind of un, uh, you know unprocessed sugar. That's one. And then trans fats. So hydrogenated fat or partially hydrogenated fat, which is there in peanut butters as well as commercially baked foods. That is another major thing. And refined flour. So it could be cakes or naan, cookies kulcha, rumali roti, any of these which have refined flour or that we call as maida, that's another major contributor. And also eating large amounts of refined carbohydrates. So this could be soft drinks or I'll say popsicles, chocolates, and uh, uh, any other snack, like even a white bread sandwich with a nice lathering of jam, you know, which is loaded with sugar. And physical activity is something which is missing. And during the pandemic, uh, kids were cooped up at home and they were attending online classes. They were also sleeping late. Gadget usage had become so high. And while they were stressed, they couldn't go out and play. And uh, I think all that they did was eat a lot and then again sit for the classes. So there was hardly any kind of activity. Now, besides that, also fried foods. So um, it could be you know, the chakli or any of those namkeens, bujiyas that they were consuming. So all these fried foods, starchy vegetables, because a lot of children might not like to eat those goat vegetables or the so-called healthy non-starchy vegetables, but would prefer arbi, alu, those kind of starchy vegetables and that too, fried ones. And I think these were major contributors. And this can really have a big impact. And one more thing that I forgot to mention is the fruit juice. So milkshakes, fruit juices, uh, that also contributed quite a lot during the pandemic. And this age group, they were consuming quite a lot. And this can uh, trigger or rather contribute a lot to the PCOS. Okay, that's, that's it looks like a very long list of foods. But basically, I think it's the sugars and the refined foods is what you're emphasizing on. Am I right? Yes. Right. Okay, great. Um, uh, Aruna, the next question to you is, you've already talked about lifestyle being an influential factor in uh, uh, PCOS. Uh, do you think genetics also plays a role in PCOS? And if yes, well, in, in a family, if one woman has PCOS, then is it likely that other you know, uh, women also in that family, her kin, let's say, uh, they also are likely to develop PCOS? As we say that PCOS uh, can be of two varieties. One is obese PCOS, another is thin PCOS. And we are seeing girls with absolutely very thin and um, good BMI or in fact low BMI and still they are not getting proper periods or developing acne and facial hair and all, all other symptoms of PCOS. So that is called thin PCOS. In obese PCOS, we know the causative factor is obesity and bad metabolism or insulin resistance because of obesity. Or, or excessive fat cells. And we can always tell them that, okay, you have to have, like you should not, be, you should be avoiding bakery products, have fiber rich diet and do exercise and it will be good. But if a thin girl comes, uh, what to advise her? Because her BMI is already low. She uh, is thin and she uh, must be anorexic and not eating properly. Those girls have genetic mutant in them, which is uh, uh, they are carrier of PCOS gene. And as we know that human being is uh, evoluting uh, every after every decade and all, and we know uh, uh, these by, by, from where PCOS has come, uh, this is a new gene, this is a new disorder. But because we know that most of the time, mothers who did not breastfeed their kids uh, they have uh, this kind of gene because, see, breastfeeding uh, uh, prevents hypertension, diabetes, heart disease in kids when they breast, they, they have breastfeeding for six months or at least a year or so. So when we are not providing them good immunity in their initial years, uh, when they uh, should be breastfed, uh, that is one thing. And uh, another thing is that over the years, as it is a lifestyle disorder. So why in one family, everybody's obese? Why in one family, everybody is having, or every second person is having diabetes or hypertension? Because food habits are common. And those food habits are common. And that is how genetically now, the, there is a mutation in their gene and it is passing to girls and they are 
also develop in PCOS. And in those girls, uh, because diet, we definitely say, okay, eat healthy and you can gain weight, but exercise plays a beautiful role. Uh, if these girls, they start any kind of activity like uh, uh, basketball, football, or um, excessive, aggressive uh, physical activity, they start their periods beautifully without any hormonal treatment. But initially, yes, we have to put them to protect their uterus by endometrium lining because they do not bleed for six months or a year uh, without hormonal treatment. So for initially, we have to uh, give them uh, a little nudge to their system um, in terms of good metabolism and uh, to for them to bleed every month. But as soon as they start good healthy diet and exercise, and exercise is the mainstay in thin PCOS. No, people and yes there are two varieties one is thick obese and another is thin which is genetically predisposition to yes. a beautiful answer it's so well you distinguished between the thin and the obese uh, pcos thank you so much for that so talking about uh, obese uh, pcos shiny in your experience how easy is it for a woman with pcos to lose weight I'm sure a lot of people come to you for weight management. Yes. Oh, that's a fantastic question. Thank you for asking. Because a lot of people would come for weight reduction. They'll say, I've been going to the fitness studio, exercising quite a lot, and still I don't see any change in the waist up ratio or perhaps the abdominal fat, and I don't see results at all. And that's when you really suspect that there could be an underlying problem. And then get the blood test done, and then you notice there's insulin resistance and PCOS. So when they come back with the diagnosis, after they have met with the gynecologist and the endocrinologist, they come with a solid a diagnosis on paper. That's when the intervention starts. So what needs to be told or rather educated is uh, this is a hormonal issue and then there should be a, a multi-pronged approach and not just focusing on one aspect. And that's the most important aspect, like how Dr. Arna had mentioned, uh, if one is overweight, yes, they're able to actually understand, but then when you have lean PCOS or thin PCOS, and uh, that's when the task is much more to make them understand, like you could be lean, but it's just that the ratio of the muscle mass that you have is quite low, and you really need to focus on increasing that because that's going to help eventually for uh, reversing or uh, solving this condition. And as you had asked, Mashila, it is easy as long as they understand what's the concept, what's the principle, and how the diet should be taken forward. So it's about sleeping on time, uh, getting adequate sunlight, eating on time, understanding the ratio of protein versus fiber-rich foods and good fats and uh, carbohydrate, and of course, exercising, there should be a lot of emphasis on increasing lean muscle mass, and also to reduce the cortisol level. So that's where the yoga sanas and all that is very, very helpful. So it's those four or five things together, and we really work with the clients, the results are amazing. We're able to reverse a lot of uh, cases. I don't know, what are the signs and symptoms of PCOS? How, do, how does one identify or suspect PCOS? Layperson. See, um, in my practice, I would say that uh, nowadays girls are coming uh, uh, self diagnosing themselves and they are coming that they have PCOS. And then we have to say, okay, how do you tell that you have PCOS? So that we got one ultrasound and preventive health examination, and ovaries are showing multiple cysts, and that's how we know that we have PCOS. So this is one uh, aspect that, okay, everybody who has got her preventive health checkup done and ovaries are showing multiple cysts, which are their own eggs, which are shown there, they call it PCOS. So it is diagnosis done according to them. But PCOS is a syndrome again, and we just cannot diagnose it. Ultrasound is the least, uh, uh, would be the last modality to diagnose PCOS. So first thing to the audience would be ultrasound cannot diagnose PCOS. You have, we have to diagnose PCOS clinically first. So your symptoms first, signs later, blood test and ultrasound. So ultrasound has the last um, weightage to, to when we diagnose PCOS. So what kind of symptoms you should uh, present with if you have PCOS? PCOD. Uh, one thing would be, okay, I have irregular period. My cycles are delayed after every 45 days or after 60 days, or sometimes I do not get for many months. Uh, this is the cyclicity. 
yes few percent of people would be having a regular cycle also it's not that everybody would be but yes this uh, menstrual irregularity is given the most weight followed by any uh, signs of testosterone excess of testosterone so excess of testosterone can be acne which is like on, on chin or facial hair or vitre fair all those things again here is a here again is a confusion any girl who is already like from before puberty is having excess hair growth suddenly they say that okay this is one of the symptoms which i, I have and then we have to dig it that okay these uh, hair excess facial hair were there before puberty also or it, they are newly developed so you have to be like any girl can be hairy from birth that's that's absolutely normal if it is not newer thing which has developed after puberty then you should not be considering every facial hair as pcos acne again is a problem of adolescent adolescents and young girls can have acne okay we have to again see the whole whole syndrome acne where exactly they are having acne hyperpigmentation of skin underarms nip of neck all those things are symptoms of insulin resistance so yes acne extra facial hair hyperpigmentation of axilla hyperpigmentation of nape of neck and menstrual irregularity these are the symptoms of pcos somebody would come with infertility also somebody would come with that i'm not able to lose weight uh, and when we do insulin resistance it is positive so after these symptoms we do few tests to have like to support our diagnosis they should be evidence based medicine so if i ask them to get hormonal test or insulin resistance test and all those tests they can be two scenarios it can be normal it can be abnormal sometimes it is the tests are normal but they have obvious symptoms of pcos we say okay subclinically uh, you are have this uh, you know, these these tests are normal but subclinically they must be abnormal after few months you might see their uh, abnormality might emerge and test can be absolutely abnormal okay uh, male hormones are high and hormonal uh, upheaval is going on then once we see that okay there is abnormality in hormone third thing would be ultrasound and ultrasound mostly is to see endometrial thickness then why if you have not bed for 3 months thickness is should not be um, uh, as such that i should suspect that you might be developing a, you might be in the spectrum of cancer like pre cancerous or something so we tell them that if you are not getting a regular periods after every 45 days just take five days of progesterone and bleed otherwise your endometrial thickness would go on and on and there are chances that uh, there must be abnormal bleeding or abnormal thickness and it can lead to some grave situation so last is ultrasound when we do ultrasound it's not only number of follicle we see we see what is the volume of both the ovaries if volume is more than 10 cc then we say ki okay your tests are also showing up normal abnormality your symptoms are and there are signs on your face and everywhere uh, now you come into that bracket and now treatment would depend upon what is the ask okay if it is a young girl and she wants her acne and facial hair to be removed then treatment would be different if somebody is not getting regular periods treatment would be different and if somebody is asking for fertility treatment would be different so but level 1 therapy would always be dietary modification and exercise followed by we can help them if there there are abnormalities in their blood test reports we have targeted therapy for each and every symptom and each and every ask wonderful um, i hope the young girls and the mother especially are making note of these points because you've explained it so well the various steps to uh, you know the symptoms and signs and finally diagnosis of pcos thank you aruna for that uh, shaini moving on to you uh, do you recommend diets like a ketogenic diet or mediterranean diet or paleolithic diets and all of those for uh, pcos that's a fabulous question because uh, the past 5 years we have seen so many diet specialized diets come and go uh, definitely not the ketogenic diet uh, but i would rather look at something which is a modified paleolithic diet 
and uh, something that's Indianized because Western diets, we can't cut, copy, paste and that doesn't really work with our population. We are so used to our dal, roti, chawal uh, and the local vegetables and all that. So sustainability is a big issue because we have seen in the past five years, people who went on self <laughs> diets or else uh, they looked up in the internet and went on their own plan. They have lost weight and regained a lot more than they should. So that's not a good space to be in and uh, they're very they have a very bad relationship with food because they're very scared to even eat like poha or idlis yeah two pieces of toast they've gone to the other extreme so from one extreme to the other so we definitely don't want people to have that kind of a relationship with food so it's something more sustained something which is indianized uh, so the diet recall helps understanding what their family dynamics are the budget allocation for food and where they live and uh, what are their preferences and if they have any food allergies or intolerances taking that into account uh, definitely a low carbohydrate diet makes a big difference as far as pcos and insulin resistance is concerned and then of course increasing the fiber and protein and adding good fats that is omega-3 rich fats so this is the kind of diet or rather the approach that I have uh, used and in my practice and the results have been good. So a modified paleolithic diet and then slowly tweaking it as we proceed with uh, uh, good exercise and a healthy lifestyle. Yes. Okay, that's, that's, that's wonderful to hear. So when you say low carbohydrate diet, how low do you really go? Because I think ketogenic diet also talks about very low carbohydrates, right? Yeah. So, uh, and but you say you don't prescribe ketogenic diets. So, how low do you really go when it comes to carbs? So, I'd rather go with uh, complex carbohydrates, and um, we would rather look at around 30 30 percent. Uh, that would be uh, a moderate one to look at. But again, there are times when some of the clients uh, have very high resistance, insulin resistance, and they do not respond to even that little bit of complex carbohydrates or the healthy carbohydrates. That could be in the form of, say, a red rice flakes or else a whole wheat atta roti or bajra roti or nachni roti, any of those. Even one, if they're going to eat for each meal and over a period of time and we don't see results, we just realize that they have very uh, high insulin resistance. So depending on the degree of insulin resistance, the carbohydrate intake is tweaked as we proceed. Another factor is also to educate them that carbohydrates can come in not just through grains, but also through starchy vegetables like potatoes, yam, colocasia, or carrots, beetroots, aloe pumpkins, and also different varieties of dals. So the rajma, chana, chole, whatever they're consuming, that also has around 30, 40% carbohydrates. So if they understand that sugars could come through any form, but then we are looking at the most healthy ones. And so I think a good balance will be around 30, 40%. And then if they're not responding, go a little further down to say around 25, but then uh, if they're not on metformin, that's another thing. So we'll be in touch with the doctor. And if the doctor, uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Aruna had mentioned, you know, medications, and it's a multi-pronged approach. So based on that, the tweaking is done. Okay, that's excellent information. Thank you, Shaini. Um, Aruna, next question to you is, uh, I think most people fear that, you know, a woman with PCOS cannot conceive. And that's the fear, not only in the girl's mind, for the person who has PCOS, but also probably in the family's mind. So uh, can they conceive at a later stage? See, it's a lifestyle disorder. Uh, and uh, today itself, I saw a patient who uh, has reduced 15 kgs weight um, uh, for her wedding. And uh, within three years, she gained, she regained the whole thing. And she, when she sat in front of me, she said that she knows that she, she from the time she's born, she thinks that she's having PCOS and she does not get her periods without tablets. But when she reduced weight, she was getting absolutely good periods. And now again, she is back to that uh, weight and again, periods are stopped. So I said that, okay, now you have already told about therapy that one, see, that was if it was this easy that you reduce weight and you got your periods and getting periods means you're ovulating every month. Ovulation every month is fertility. So if in 12 months period, you are getting 12 periods every month, 
it means at least 70% of time cycles are ovulatory. So every month you have chance of uh, conception. But if you are not having periods for say for six months, there is no egg formation. And those are the eggs when we do ultrasound, we see that the, those eggs are accumulated inside the ovaries and those are seen like necklace pattern or we say multiple eggs are seen or ovaries are increased in volume because they are not coming out every month. So yes, PCOD patients would be having difficulty in conception because they are not ovulating every month because they are not menstruating every month. If they lose weight and uh, start menstruating every month, it's really, really easy. There is no, we, I do not even treat my patient till they uh, promise me that they would come back within three months after reducing five to 10 kgs of whatever their weight BMI has to be within uh, 25. So I would uh, totally, uh, I, I would refrain writing any medicine, uh, even if it is metformin for that matter, because if you're taking metformin and uh, I, all those inositol medicines and all, you start believing that it will help, but it would not help till you start your momentum towards weight loss. So you have to first lose weight and then start therapy and losing weight in itself is a treatment. Uh, you, once you start getting menstruation, it's not a difficult thing. The PCOS patient can conceive absolutely beautifully if they have a good lifestyle and if they start menstruating every month. So uh, connecting, I mean, uh, in connection to the same uh, question, are birth control pills which are prescribed for this problem, are they safe? So um, again, here, there are two things. Birth control pills are not prescribed as birth control pills here. They are prescribed for them to have regular periods as uh, in uh, the previous question also, when I said that they have to menstruate every month, otherwise uterine cavity is not going to be healthy. Otherwise, when they bleed after a few months, it can be really, really torrential or heavy bleed. Or if they do not beat and visual cavity is not shedding every month and it is also not a good thing. So when we give uh, oral contraceptive pills, which is uh, in this case is a specific kind of uh, pill, we give for them to regularize their period. And we know that because they, these are the hormones we are giving from outside and that is why they are bleeding. But we want them first to start lose weight and start having their periods by their own. But if they are helpless to do that, or if they are taking a little while, we put them on uh, oral contraceptive pills for them to bleed every month, one. But uh, this tablet, specifically PCOS uh, 21 day tablet course, is beautifully, uh, like it, it is really, really effective in reducing acne, in reducing extra facial hair, so they get this boost in their confidence once they have clearer skin and better, uh, uh, this thing, all, all the symptoms are also subsiding. So this helps in that also. So one pill is effective in regulating their periods, reducing their acne, reducing their extra facial hair or hyperpigmentation. And if they are not in that reproductive age group or they do not want to conceive right now and they, are, they want to wait for that, it acts as an oral contraceptive pill as well. And oral contraceptive pill are the best contraceptive pill for anybody who's newlywed, who's in a living relationship, or who has not had a kid uh, till now. So it, it is multifunctional. So it gives them many benefits. And the question was whether it's harmful or not. Absolutely not harmful. But you should have, you should, like your doctor should know that you do not have a history of any kind of hormone dependent cancer or deep vein thrombosis, because in those cases, we do not want progesterone, progestational side effects or water retention or any kind of predisposition if you have towards cancer. Otherwise, as an oral concept pill, also it is good. And for PCOS also, if you do not want to conceive right now for regularization of periods is also it's good. Uh, so the, basically the bottom line is for the women and the girls to know that they should not self-diagnose PCOS. They should meet experts like you, uh, you know, in, and also not self-medicate. And they should get a prescription, a diagnosis, prescription, treatment. All of that should be done with an expert uh, gynecologist and obstetrician and not, you know, take it upon themselves to move forward with this problem. Shiny, uh, one more question on diets. 
uh, do gluten free and or dairy free diets work for PCOS? Because I know sometimes you do prescribe gluten free and dairy free diets for some people, but is it for PCOS or something else? Yes, you're right, ma'am. Uh, I do prescribe gluten free, dairy free diets. Uh, the main concern is uh, the quality of milk that is available in the market these days. And uh, the main agenda is to ensure that we reduce the inflammation at the cellular level. That's the thing. We're just trying to set the environment right and then implement everything. Then the nutrition or the diet really works well. The results are fantastic. Uh, it's just that some have bloating issues and they have uh, difficulty absorbing nutrients or some have very low vitamin B12 in spite of them being non-vegetarians or there could even be low iron levels. And most often, it's not just about what we eat. You are what you eat is something that we've heard always. But you are what you absorb is another you know, new thing that we've all been hearing about because absorption is very crucial. So even if an individual chooses the right kind of foods, has the nutritional knowledge, our body should be able to absorb. And what happens is if there are hidden issues like food allergies or intolerances, then that starts interfering. And the most common food intolerance that we have come across is the gluten and dairy intolerance, uh, the quality of dairy, as well as uh, the origin of the cow, what they have been fed, the quality of the feed also impacts the quality of the or the nature of the milk. So considering all this, at least for a short period of time, the gluten-free, dairy-free diet truly helps. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, so is there an ideal diet that uh, would suit all women with PCOS up? Perhaps not. And if not, then would the diets be very individualized for every person based on the health profile? Or how do you manage diets for PCOS uh, you know, people who come to you? So uh, there is a basic framework and then the tweaking happens based on the individual requirements. So the basic framework is to make sure that we do not trigger or worsen the insulin resistance. So removing the refined carbohydrates, the processed foods, the sugars from the diet truly helps a lot. The next would be to increase the protein. So good quality protein or protein of high biological value. And most Indian diets are pretty deficient in protein. So that's a huge concern. So that's where the ratio of carbohydrate or grain versus protein comes in. So the idea is to give more protein and definitely more fiber and that too from various colorful vegetables and fruits. And fruits, again, not as juices, but as whole fruits is very, very helpful. And uh, this actually also takes care of the gut health. And which means the nutrients are well absorbed. Then all the vitamin mineral deficiencies go away. And uh, we are optimizing the entire environment in the body that truly helps. And removing all the bad fats and bringing in the good fats. So when all these come together, the results are fantastic. Now the tweaking will happen depending on whether a person is a vegan, a vegetarian, over vegetarian, or if they have certain preferences, or if they're working in different time zones, or if uh, a person doesn't rather have the habit of eating breakfast, then they might be more comfortable with an intermittent fasting routine. So that's where these adjustments come. But the basic framework is definitely a lot of good fats, high protein, high fiber, and a little bit of complex carbohydrates. Wow, that's, a, that's a beautiful ending to a uh, uh, diet for PCOS, I think. Thank you so much, Shiny, for your uh, illuminating insights. Thank you, Mashila. It has been such a wonderful opportunity to be here. And uh, thanks so much uh, for this interactive session. I learned a lot from Dr. Kaldra and you. And I think uh, it's really been nice to be part of TIP. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arna Kalra. You've been really wonderful with uh, you know, answering all the questions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sheila. It was really nice to be here and to explain everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.